code will back to direction and it computer science department. This is a series, one of the series of design for people seminar um, supported by PPI and computer science. Uh, today, we will have Saeed Ahmed from University of Toronto. He's a, a professor in computer science department there. And his research interest lies in the connection between human computer interaction and information and communication technology and development. ICPD, or somebody, some other people say ICPD. Uh, so of course, for someone who is new to this field, it's a journal of study in the probably social, political, and economic development of marginalized or underprivileged people and communities. Um, maybe my definition is not maybe, <laughs> but Ishtar can clarify that much better throughout this talk, I think. Um, Ishtar is leading third space research group at New Toronto, um, working on that topics. And also, he's leading a transnational research initiative between Canada and the US. Um, he's one of the founder of an inno innovation lab in Bangladesh to promote grassroots level innovation in the country. So if you're interested in those initiatives, you can chat with Ishtar too. He received his PhD from Cornell University in 2017, so we graduated really the same um, school. And we started, I mean, I, I've seen him start as a super, super smart computer scientist, and then watching him turning himself into a sociologist throughout <laughs> only five, five, six years of PhD, which was super remarkable. So if you wanna, uh, if, you, if you're interested in extending your expertise into you know, computer science, or how you wanna learn, how you can take into the interview that is a, he's a great person to talk And today, he will give us a talk about his research on developing people and design technology thinking and building towards such a sustainable development. Let's start with Claudine. Thank you. Thank you, Jumbo, for this nice words. It's like, uh, you know, like that is, you, 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 when you hear this coming from your, your friend and uh, in a different part of the world, uh, it, it feels good, uh, but don't trust everything that he said. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, so welcome. I'm uh, uh, delighted and privileged uh, honor to be here before the esteemed uh, community of the University of British Columbia. Um, and uh, thank you, DFP, for inviting me here. Thank you, Jungle, for your nice introduction. So today I'll be talking about uh, something that uh, I do or I try to do is understanding people and designing technology, thinking and building towards sustainable development. And um, I see this as an uh, intersection between computer science and, uh, and social development. I'm an assistant professor at the University of uh, Toronto in their computer science department. Um, and this is kind of like my short biography. I had my PhD in information science at Cornell. Uh, I graduated last year, and I had my undergraduate and master's from Bangladesh in computer science. So in today's talk, I'll be first talking about my research objective and approach, then the research questions that I, I address. Uh, I'll walk you through a couple of my past projects, then I'll be talking about my future work. So let's start with my research objective and approach. By the way, just feel free to like raise your hand and ask questions anytime during the talk. I don't mind at all. And we'll also have some time for, uh, for discussion after the talk if you want. Uh, so I grew up in Bangladesh, a very beautiful country in Southeast Asia, and um, it's a it's a country where uh, which is um, which is labeled as developing or low income country by World Bank and United Nations. And when I was growing up there in Bangladesh during the 90s, I never saw like uh, many people complaining about uh, about living there for the local people, but it was always a development project for the uh, Western world. And uh, in late 90s and in early 2000, I saw technology, especially information and communication technology devices, computers, laptops, mobile phones, Wi-Fi, um, broadband, those all started coming into the country and they created opportunity for millions of people around the world for bringing changes for their life. So I was interested in understanding that uh, whether they were actually addressing the needs of those underserved communities there uh, in, in Bangladesh. And uh, 
how we could work with them to improve the quality of the life of the people here with the help of these technologies. Because I was clearly see a mismatch between how technology was being used in, in Bangladesh and what are the needs that those people actually have, actually have there in the field. So for this, when I was an undergraduate student, just graduated with my undergrad, I formed this group of uh, uh, HCI researchers, all, all like my fellow uh, undergraduate students in Bangladesh, uh, first HCI group there, human computer interaction group in Bangladesh. And we started um, going to the marginalized communities in the country and designing computer science solutions for them. So it was kind of like a fun journey from there and with this group and uh, with many other uh, of my collaborators in last nine years, I, uh, I have started uh, different marginalized groups in, in India and Bangladesh, including regiment garments workers, um, taxi drivers, uh, mobile phone repairers, and uh, many other people uh, I'll be talking about in a minute. So I, I position my research in the intersection between human-computer interaction and information and communication <coughs> technology for development. Uh, and most of the work that I'll be talking today uh, has been published in uh, venues like uh, ACM, CHI, CSCW, ICTD, DEV, and DIS. Uh, so what is ICTD and how, what, what it means to build technologies for marginalized population of uh, people in developing countries? Uh, we are familiar with, uh, with the number of these technologies which have been deployed in different parts of the world. For example, community radio was introduced, uh, especially in Southeast Asia, for helping the local people know about their, uh, the information that they need, <coughs> and they were also be able to produce their own news, which then we could circulate in uh, other communities, like other villages who wanted that news. Then we uh, know about mobile money, which is uh, now very popular in Africa, where you can actually send money from one person to another using mobile phone. This has you know, brought about some dynamics and, and financial transaction system. Then we have one laptop per, one laptop per child project, which, uh, uh, which was first built by MIT Media Lab, which targeted to educate all the poor people around the, poor children around the world with the help of a cheap laptop. So some of these projects were successful, some projects had some success stories, but unfortunately most of these projects were uh, failed, and they failed for different reasons. And, and designing and developing a technology, a successful technology for marginalized communities is actually challenging. This is challenging because um, this <coughs> it's, it's really hard to understand the actual problem because a lot of times the designers and developers, we kind of like bring uh, a different kinds of perspective to the field which is not the same kind of perspective that the people in the field actually have. So we misread the problem. Sometimes we uh, cannot do much because there is a resource constraint. Um, there are cultural barriers, there are lack of training for the people who will be using the technology, uh, there are corruption and politics, and there is this lack of maintenance and repair. Uh, a lot of times we build a technology for people and we leave it there thinking that that will like, work forever, but unfortunately they don't, and people there struggle with lack of repair and maintenance and stuff. So in my research, I focus on problem identification, long-term sustainability, and cultural impact. For this, I need to understand people. And what do I mean when I say I, I, I try to understand people? I try to understand people by their culture, their politics, their economy, history, and their social practices. And then I build technologies for them which I want to be accessible, inclusive, robust, low cost, and secure. So this is the human domain for understanding people, and this is the technology domain where I build technology for addressing this problem. So my research is kind of a, a combination of these two words, understanding people and building technologies. So for understanding people, I borrow theories from development sociology, critical theory, STS, which is science and technology studies, political economy, cultural anthropology, and then I bring technical, uh, you know, like a theories uh, inputs from computer science stuff, uh, graph theory, computational geometry, mobile computing, social network analysis, social media analysis, and 
uh, computer games. So, uh, in a like, short word, I call this as my research is a combination of ethnography, which is understanding the people, and computing. So now let's let's move on to my research question. If this is my method, how do I do my research? Or what kind of like question I ask in my research? So here is what I am concerned about. So we call this era the era of data. We get data everywhere. We date, we get data on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook. We get data on you know like books. We get data on newspaper, television, radio. Uh, all kinds of media, there are like, tons of data that are flowing around us and we are like, designing and developing smart sensor for getting uh, more data and we are building smart devices for using the data. We are, we have, like, a, uh, we are building smart uh, machine learning algorithm to leverage those data to uh, build meaningful stuff for helping people. But how many times we have thought that there are so many people of whom we do not have any data? For example, think about the illiterate people around the world who do not read and write and you don't see their data on your social media or the people on news media don't talk about them. How many times we hear about the information from uh, women who are sexually harassed and don't want to talk about that? How many times we hear the information from ready-made factory workers who are exploited badly around the world but do not open their mouth because they are afraid that they may lose their job? How many times we hear information from refugees who we have labeled them as illegal so they don't open their mouth? So my research goal is to give these people voice which I define as a comprehensive socio-technical process for obtaining freedom. And in today's talk, I'll, I'll discuss different aspects of voice as I define it and how I, I build technologies for helping them getting this voice. There are four aspects of voice which I identified in my research, which are access, freedom, visibility, and infrastructure. In my research, I asked, how can technology be accessible to all? How to achieve social freedom over a technology? How can people make their voice heard? And how to make infrastructure inclusive and sustainable? These are all like mouthful of words. So I'll go, I'll like um, talk in detail about two of this, my talk my topics on access and freedom to explain this. And I'll be briefly talking about infrastructure and visibility in the later part of my talk. So now, uh, let's start with my projects. So first, I'll be talking about my project on access. So one in every five people in the world are illiterate. So it's like 20% 20, 20 of the people around the world are illiterate. And there are so many people who are semi-literate, who are uh, you know, like a digitally illiterate, and they are not uh, able to use the technology the way we use it. So the uh, computer engineers, electrical engineers, they have been wor working on this to make technologies available and accessible for them for a lot of time. And thanks to those engineers, we now have a very good mobile phone coverage almost like all over the world. And we have inexpensive uh, computing mobile phone devices. So now even the poor people can have a mobile phone and use it. But the problem is the interface is not still uh, good enough for a low literate people to use. So think about this. If you cannot read and write, how are you going to use your mobile phone, no matter how cheap it is or uh, how good the mobile coverage is? So people have done, so they're like amazing researchers and Microsoft research who tried to solve this problem by introducing graphics on their mobile phone. So instead of uh, uh, putting the text, you will see the picture of, the, of, of, your, of, of, of your contact. So you can select your contact from there and you can make the call. Uh, this was good to some extent, but um, unfortunately, you cannot like extend this for, uh, say, if your contact is has more than 30 contacts, so then you have to memorize this. And it, it also had difficulties in remembering a picture or you know how you search a pic search for a picture or a particular contact. Uh, then uh, the searchers in in Carnegie Mellon they built this speech-based. Uh, 
um, interface, which is kind of like Cortana or Siri, where you can interact with the phone with your speech, which kind of solves this problem, but this is another problem that this person, the user, has now need to learn how to operate this mobile phone, what to say to, to make the phone work for what. So it's again kind of like you need to teach them how to use the mobile phone, which uh, when they ran their field study uh, was not very successful because the older people started forgetting this. And also speech processing is kind of like an expensive computing uh, procedure which needs high-end mobile phones, which is not always available for low liter people. So when I was um, looking at these problems, I, I, I found that the designs were kind of like individual model of use. So when, so it assumed that a person, a user, will be using a mobile phone uh, in a one-on-one -on -one relationship, which means that a person will have one mobile phone and he is the sole user of this phone. So when that person's cognitive ability is not uh, you know, like uh, good enough for using this mobile phone, they start adding features on this mobile phone. But use of mobile phone is uh, sometimes different from this model. For example, in different low resource community that I have worked with, a mobile phone or a technology is shared among a number of family members or friends there. So it's not like one-on-one -on -one relationship with the, with the mobile phone and the users. So this made me think, can we leverage this collaborative model of use for solving this problem of uh, accessible interface? For this, I started working with a group of rickshaw drivers in Dhaka. Uh, there is a rickshaw garage. There were 120 rickshaw drivers there. None of them were literate, and, uh, but they were using mobile phones. So that made me interested to learn how they were actually using those. So I spent uh, six months there. I interviewed them. I, I did participatory observation, focus group discussion, and participatory design there. So what I found that when those illiterate people were trying to, you know, like uh, make a phone call by their phone, uh, they were, you know, adopting different strategies that they built. They were trying to memorize the images. They were considering the numbers as images and trying to, you know, memorize. But they are like making mistakes all the time. They are making wrong phone calls and they are being embarrassed. But the stories of their success uh, were interesting too. So they also had friends in their social network, in their, they had peers who were happy to help them. So oftentimes they would go to the people who were uh, literate enough to use a mobile phone who were helping them. So those were kind of like the rich garage owner, uh, the mobile phone repairers, and the shopkeepers. So, they, so whenever they needed help with their phone, whenever they were struggling to make a phone call, they were going to their friends and those friends were helping them. So this is kind of like ecological use of technology, which is not like defined by one-on-one, -on -one, like Western, uh, or say, personalized use of computing. It's a social consumption of technology. And it is not about either uh, only mobile phones or computing devices. When I conducted this ethnography, I went to their home and I found that everything they had in their home were actually shared with their neighbors. So uh, you, if you look at the piles of uh, pillows that they have behind, so those, those pillows were all coming from uh, different neighbors of, uh, of their neighborhood because they had a, a guest at their home a few days ago. So they you know, like borrowed those from their uh, neighbors and they will probably they even don't know with what they you know like borrow from whom and if they need it they'll uh, take those back from them so it's kind of like part of their culture this made me interested why people were helping each other so this brought me back to uh, anthropologist uh, Marcel Moss uh, who is very famous for his work on the gift he argued that this gift giving culture is uh, kind of one of the fundamental elements of uh, of, of civilization, how people build their communities. So he argued that gift giving is not purely um, a gesture of, uh, of being nice. He argued that it's mandatory for building a community and strengthening the community bond. So through the gift giving, a community actually functions, especially in this kind of marginalized communities where which are traditional culture is still there, you'll find that people are giving gifts and helping one another for maintaining this community itself. So then I was thinking, well, if they're 
happy with helping their technology by taking help, let's think about, from their perspective, where the problem comes from. I started asking them the question, where do you actually struggle with using your mobile phone? And their answer was unavailability of help. So that was the accessibility question from their perspective. They were saying that, well, I am a rickshaw driver, so I take my rickshaw and when I go out for my work and then I don't find my friends around me. At that point, I, the help is not available to me and that is the problem. That is my accessibility problem. When I am surrounded by my friend, I don't need another technology for you know, like, uh, helping me using my mobile phone. And then I say, well, cool enough. So I started designing this technologies with them. It's in a participatory design session, I conducted in, uh, in their, in their uh, rickshaw garage. And we came up with a very simple solution. It's remote helping. So the help seeker will place a phone call to the, to the person they know who are willing to help them. The helper will, uh, will from their mobile phone, will, uh, will do something which will make the seeker's mobile phone place a call to the person they want to call to. For implementing those, though, so now that I'm going toward a bit more technical stuff, so I'll kind of um, steam through this because this is not like the main use of this talk. Uh, so we designed we, the whole system in a, as a graph theory problem. We identified the low literate nodes and the helper nodes in the community. We built a network there. We found that it's a bipartite graph in where in one hand you have the helpers and on the other hand you have the people who need help and we wanted to maximize the, uh, the help seeking behavior or the helping uh, utility between the users and the helpers. And uh, this uh, turned out to be a, a famous stable matters problem, which we solved. And uh, we extended this with mixing gift with paid services. So we also wanted to see whether uh, the gift giving people's uh, intention for helping other people in their community were more were stronger than if we paid somebody to help others. So we added some uh, helper outside from their community. Uh, and we try to see who the people are more comfortable in taking help from, um, where objectives was minimizing the caller's cost, maximizing the helper's profit, and maximizing you know, their experience of using the system. We had to implement the whole system on, with mobile SMS because internet wasn't available there. Um, and there were like different kinds of mobile phones they were using, so we had to build different versions of it. There are some people who are using Symbians, there's Androids, and you know, um, all kinds of versions, like some Microsoft old versions um, installed on their mobile phones. We had to work with those. And then we also tried to minimize the number of SMSs, so we applied some jitting algorithms there. And finally, we also had to work on the privacy issues there because you were basically sharing your contact information with the helper. And then sometimes you don't want to you know, share that sensitive information there. So we only, with their suggestion, we were only uh, using the last two digits of, their, uh, of the person they wanted to call to so that they could refer with the two digits. And this was finally the final interface. This was like the askers interface who would ask for help. There was only one button here, so you cannot make any mistake. So if you press that button, you'll see the person who are willing to help you. You press any of them, and they are there or there for they're available for helping you. And this is the helpers interface. They'll be able to see the uh, original callers, missed call, dialed call, and received call list. And from there, the person will say that, well, I want to make a call to my mom or this person, and then that, the helper will select that person and the original call will be, will be made from uh, the asker's phone to the person they are calling to. So we ran a pilot with 12 participants, or six weeks of study, two kinds of helpers were there, both community people and the people from outside who we hired for uh, the paid version of this, uh, this app, and so the, like a paid scheme for helping. And we, uh, after six weeks, we interviewed them. We did focus group discussion. We were tracking their use. So what we found there, uh, everybody found this easy. And they were uh, happy because they found the more availability of help with our system. They were um, reluctant to take help from freelancers uh, who they do not know. So we found that uh, People there, where it's, it's, it's the help or give giving is very socially or culturally oriented. The people are not happy to take help from somebody they don't know. 
And they also reported that while taking health, their community bond actually strengthened. So they appreciated that part of it too. They're just saying that well, when while taking the health, we also like you know like exchange greetings and other stuff. So you know it, it brought us closer. Then we ran a six months long longitudinal study with 120 participants, and we found that our uh, result that we found in the pilot was actually supported by this study. We found the average availability of people in, the, uh, in a week. We found that over the time, their phone call rate actually increased. So they are now making more phone calls and their accuracy of making uh, phone calls actually increased to 86%, which was remarkable. And this was also a signal of uh, which average availability of health in a, uh, in a day. And then a uh, very recently Bragg, the largest engine in the world, they contacted us for uh, doing experiment with this model with their mobile money network in all 64 districts in the world, uh, 64 districts in Bangladesh. So now we are thinking of extending this model for other purposes, like other uses of mobile phones. So instead of like a, only calling a number, can we save a contact by taking the remote help or like playing music or you know playing videos on those. Uh, uh, other activities that we want to do with our mobile phone, or even like you know, like a more complex stuff like operating computers, searching online, using social media online, shopping, where we can uh, probably extend this for low literate or visually impaired senior citizens or refugees. And on the other hand, the health helper section, can we think this as a job for unemployed people, for refugees, part timers, or you know, like the learners? We have challenges too, so, so in some communities we have to be careful about the genders who are taking help and who are helping. Uh, sometimes it's a problem if the age gap is, is, is something sensitive for people that don't want to like take help for, from younger people. Sometimes we have found in a couple of cases there are quarrels between the helpers and the askers. Uh, and sometimes um, they go out of budget, so they are not happy with the money we were charging for them for help. So the basic thing in this, and, and this, like the, from this study is that um, human-computer interactions, which we often define historically as an intersection between people's cognitive ability and the, uh, and the strength of the interface can also be supplemented by social, political, and cultural strength. Uh, these are often useful when we work with just marginalized communities because maybe they do not have a very expensive mobile phones or they do not have a great education, but they have very rich social or cultural practices which we can use for maybe uh, solving problems uh, that they have with interacting with their leaders. So that was uh, the access uh, project and now we'll be talking about uh, the next thing. Uh, so now we see that a lot of people uh, cannot produce data uh, because they do not have access to the computers, but then there are other people who have access to the computers, but they still do not talk because they do not have freedom. Who are these people? So for this, think about this. The women who are victims of sexual harassment. So in this project, I worked uh, with the uh, victims of sexual harassment in Bangladesh. So here is kind of like the context uh, when I was doing this work uh, back in 2012 or 2013. There are about 5,000 incidents of sexual violence uh, were reported in Dhaka between October 2011 to September 2012. There are 12,000 harassment uh, were reported in the country in 2014, in the following year. However, the problem is most incidents of sexual harassment go unreported. And if you think that this recent hashtag MeToo movement was kind of breaking the silence, you should also know that this movement didn't work in Bangladesh or you know, in many parts of the world where women are not comfortable sharing their experiences over social media in public. So we wanted to learn why, what is the reason behind this silence. So we conducted uh, first an online survey and we asked 120, uh, so they're like participated, the survey was participated by 120 Bangladeshi women. We asked them about their experiences of whether they were even uh, like a, uh, the sexually harassing their life, what they feel about it. All 120 participants, female participants who participated in the survey, they say that they were harassed, sexually harassed directly or indirectly in their life. 
and one of them said this, you will hardly find any Bangladeshi girl who travels on the streets and has not experienced sexual harassment. Some women are brave enough to talk about this while others remain silent for many reasons. So when, yes. How did you even reach? So that's a good question. So we, we like shared this online survey on social media. We waited for three months and we got 120 responses and this doesn't you know, represent anything. Welcome there. So, so this, this was entirely uh, convenient sample. You have, you have no way of reaching people who aren't yeah. already online. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. So we wanted to know more about this. If this problem is this much prevalent in the country, what are the you know, like deeper reasons for this? So we thought we'd be doing one-on-one -on -one interviews. So we started interviewing only so we then narrowed down our participants to like educated college going women in Dhaka. So that is probably the you know like the like the population who are um, most active on social media. So let's okay try with the easiest population, like most accessible population for us. So we we so our my female colleagues they started interviewing them and we you know like advertised this for a whole one year in three major universities in Dhaka and we only got eleven interviews only eleven participants volunteers they showed up and they shared their um, their stories with us um, and there are so many stories where they scheduled an interview and they did not come. Some of them came, and then at the last minute, they decided not to talk. Some started talking in the middle of the interview. They walked out. Some started crying in the middle of the interview. Some came with their mom. Some even you know, like completed the whole interview and then went out and then called us back and requested us to delay the interview. All these things happened there. But what we found from this 11 interview that we finally could you know, like collect, uh, that whenever they, sh they could share their stories with others, they felt good. But that was the only thing we could learn from there. And we could also learn that this was kind of like a difficult problem. It's, it's not probably something we can address with data. So then, so as like HCI researchers, we are like thinking about methods and methods. So we said, well, uh, would that help them if we did a focus group interviews where they would see like other women too who were you know, kind of like finding the same kind of experiences? Uh, so the female uh, colleague of mine who conducted this, uh, this uh, focus group discussion came back after one hour and said, well, 50 minutes of that one hour uh, discussion was well, actually silence. People were like, you know, either looking blank, looking at each other, didn't talk. But there are like a few comments which was very deep. For example, here, one uh, woman said that my mother taught me to stay quiet, but I'll ask my daughter to carry a knife. So this, like you know, like one or two examples, like two, you know, put forth sort of like a word that we heard from uh, from our participants, kind of, you know, told us how um, how deep this problem is, how deep, like you know, agonies they they held in their mind. So when we were analyzing the data, you know, like uh, with our usual HCI techniques, we found that like. They wanted the only sport help. Some they mentioned that if there was help at the sport, we probably you know like yeah, feel better. Uh, they wanted to reach out to their friends. They felt good when they shared their experiences. But then, like our research team, we said like, well, stop. These are of course important things, but these are not the problems. The problem here is silence. They are not talking about this. If you want to do something here, we need to design for breaking the silence. And this then brought us to. This, uh, this uh, bigger theory of uh, silence. Um, uh, Post-colonial researcher, Diatis Biba, famously said, can the subaltern speak? So she was a scholar of literature. She's a professor at Columbia University. She was arguing that even language, which has been evolved in male-dominated society for a long period of time, has more uh, words for expressing male emotions than for female emotions. So even language is biased then how can we think about an unbiased, equal, neutral technological platform which uh, has not historically been concerned of, uh, of women's uh, voice? Uh, so they I have a question. No. Yep. So I sort of know that word. I just looked it up. Now I know exactly. But I think this is an interesting example of colonial experience. Uh, yeah. We who are not currently 
colonizers, never mind the past, and weren't recently in our life subjected to it, don't even know what that word means. Whereas I'm kind of guessing the country you grew up in, this is still a word that's in use. Um, and so those kinds of language gaps actually right. mean that someone like me trying to do the kind of work you're doing isn't even going to understand the problem when I hear a word like that as part of the problem statement. Right, yes. And adding to that, so the context of this question was, so Gatri Stewart was telling a story of a Hindu girl. Um, so in the pre-colonial period, there's a Hindu culture that uh, a, a young girl would be married with an old person if the person was rich. And when the person would die, they would burn the girl alive with that person. Now, so the story that, uh, that Gatri was saying that uh, the people were dragging the girl to burn alive with, with, that, with that dead man. And the girl was not happy. He, was, he, he didn't want to die. And then the colonial you know, like, uh, saviors arrived, the British people arrived, and then they said, well, we want to save this girl. We want to take her away from their community. And here we have this, our liberal Western feminism thing. We want to save this girl. The girl did not want to go to them either. So then. Then uh, Gayatri posed this question. So this girl is a subaltern. Does she have a voice? She can only say yes or no. But there is something between yes and no, which is probably her answer. So that, that as you mentioned correctly, that it kind of like, you know, this goes beyond this binary division, how the world probably works. We see things between colonizer and colonized, but it's more, uh, you know, like there are several nuances in there. So anyway, so when we take this example to this, this idea of how we design technologies, either for men or female, or we say that, well, this technology will work, we have to think about who is colonizing this technology world. And as we will see in a minute, that the answer is probably very obvious to us, we the men, right? Um, so anyway, so then I was looking at this mobile phone application that were built in this part of the world, in the, the developed part of this world for helping women to report sexual harassment. Uh, there is this Harris map in the uh, in Middle East, and then there is uh, this uh, hola back uh, in the United States. And these were kind of like built for shaming uh, the harasser. And then we, our participants said, well, probably we are not going to do that. That's not supported in our culture. And, we, and that will like, actually create animosity in the, the closely knitted communities. So we started working on that. But first of all, we wanted to build a system where you know, the, the the victim would kind of like get uh, on the location help uh, with a location-based application. But I was working in Bangladesh where there was no map there. So uh, what I started doing is uh, uh, getting some uh, undergraduate students. I taught them how to build maps with GPS, with this uh, uh, open street map tools. And, uh, Within one year of work, we could um, make a rough map of for the Dhaka city where we first deployed our application. Then we converted this whole problem with a geometry problem and like kind of like a skimming through this. So if these are like the crime zones, who are the people who can reach out to the help for helping a, a victim? Uh, so we pointed that with a circle. Then we were thinking about how uh, we can put a police in between two circles so that we can minimize the police uh, needed for you know, like put, uh, putting on a surveillance on this. So this then came into a problem of uh, how we divide this whole, uh, whole 2D place and Voronoi diagram, and then the Launay triangulation. And then this became a game theoretical optimization problem, how we can, with minimum number of policies, we can maximize the surveillance. And then we, uh, we added this, how we can isolate the crime score so that criminals cannot like you know, like pass from uh, one place to another, and how, what is the cost of inserting a new police? So basically, it, uh, uh, it gave us a route for the police from pass from one end to another end of the city um, in a certain time interval to maximize the surveillance. Also, this is the map for, say, a women is the safest map as we claim uh, for women to avoid uh, the harassment stuff. Um, yeah, so this is the route that we suggested. And we uh, incorporated this algorithm in our mobile phone application, where it also had 
features for adding frames, reporting an incident, and a panic button where you know if a woman is attacked, uh, she could ask for help, and then the help would uh, propagate like this. And then we were also uh, showing the live maps of harassment as uh, users were generating those with their application on a web uh, on a website, which also had uh, people for sharing their experiences, telling others where to go and where to not. And we are also having a Facebook page where we are anonymously posting this kind of uh, incidents to create awareness in the, in the community. Soon we started getting a lot of reports coming in. Women were anonymously you know, like sharing their uh, experiences on this website. Uh, they are like, uh, talking about all kinds of harassment there, starting from like cat calls, um, you know, like, um, uh, grabbing, all kinds of harassment were there. Uh, the website was kind of like flooding. You know, there are 12,000 police reports in a year, and we we were getting like more than thousand reports in a day. So that was like this this bad. Um, so this uh, website soon got like a lot of like media attention from BBC and very national, many national and international uh, media platforms. But soon we started find the problem, find the problem, which was coming from the male chauvinist communities were saying that it was coming kind of like a victim blaming. They were saying that it was the fault of the girl who didn't cover their data, this kind of stuff. So women at some point started holding themselves back from sharing this information. Uh, then there are like other controversies there. Women are saying that when you are showing this, this many like incidents were happening in the city and when our parents were looking at this map, they were restricting our, you know, like our movement uh, freely. So that was, uh, so at that point, we actually stopped uh, our website. Uh, we just made this safe route suggestion for the women, but we are not showing them how many incidents were happening there, where data was not actually helping them. Uh, right now, these apps kind of like converted into a help seeking act, help help seeking act, uh, where we, if a women feel bad after the harassment, then they can talk, but the actual application doesn't uh, exist. So it's a story of a failed application, you can say. But we learned from that how difficult the problem is. So in HCI and in many other disciplines, we start with data collection and then we analyze the requirement and then we build application, we evaluate. But what happens when we don't get the data? It's, it's difficult to get the data, how we even start. So we started thinking about this and we thought, well, then why don't we teach the women how to build their application, their own application, so they don't have to share their data with others. So we initiated this um, initiative called Coded Guard, where we are teaching women for building their own app and uh, like thinking this as a movement, women movement for with with computation. Uh, which also we, we we are still running this in Bangladesh, but we are we are also facing a lot of problems there. You know, like uh, the women who are trying to take this as their job are not you know, getting jobs in the industry and so on. So we also like try to understand this kind of a. Uh, problem with voice with marginalized people, as I don't have much time, I'll uh, just skip this uh, through. So we can, I conducted ethnography with regular garments workers in Bangladesh. I asked them about their problems, and they were not uh, you know, like opening their mouth. So I asked them to draw a picture, one picture of their home and one picture of their, the place where they work in. So this is one of the 64 pictures that we collected from them. Uh, can you see any difference, like main difference between these two pictures? So here's the answer. When they were like drawing the pictures of their, the place that they work, uh, they were using more rigid lines, like regular figures, like rectangles and uh, straight lines. But when they were uh, drawing the same thing for their home, it was like more freehand, uh, fluid sort of stuff. So when we took help from uh, psychoanalysis of writing and we found that people were feeling more comfortable there and they were feeling eased when they were uh, at, uh, at their workplaces. So now we're uh, trying to match this, uh, this kind of information from there using the local art to portray this on the local platform on the body of the richer to create a public display of, uh, of silence. So now the other uh, project that I work on, uh, visibility, is uh, it comes with this question of, well, when you give people the voice, now they are taught how many times we, we actually listen to them. So Gayatri Sriva, once again, uh, she said, who will speak is less crucial than who will listen. So for this, I also work with this uh, profession that where, uh, where work is not 
valued as much as they should have valued. So I worked with mobile phone repairers in, uh, in the underground market in Bangladesh. I worked with them for six months. I learned how to fix a mobile phone, and I found that how traditional knowledge was used in fixing uh, sophisticated technologies there, but which were not valued the way we value the designers and developers. So I started writing about their art and craft, their learning and sustainability, their values, and how privacy is practiced there. Uh, I joined with their movement, and then I argued that how this kind of local and traditional knowledge is useful for making the technology sustainable from the ground. This is one work I have still been doing. Uh, so I extended the similar kind of argument when I was starting the use of Uber and Ola, the share, the ride sharing application with the Indian taxi drivers there. I found that how their local expertise of the experienced driver were not valued in the application where market was taken over by the young people who are good at uh, operating mobile phones, but not probably as much good in driving uh, uh, as their, uh, their senior counterparts. Uh, Finally, the infrastructure, when we talk about uh, design project, we design, we often talk about products, but what about the infrastructural violence? Um, so right now, it's a problem about like 50, because 50 million people, uh, million people uh, for the first time are homeless in the post-World War II era, and low-income countries have, are hosting over 86% of this world's refugees. So I was kind of like uh, envisioning the way these marginalized people were still living in our uh, giant architecture or establishment as kind of like how a spider uh, builds its uh, web, uh, kind of like you know attaching itself with the with the bigger like a uh, infrastructure through hacking, making, and repairing, and how their local innovation was crucial in uh, in uh, surviving or like keeping their boys alive. Uh, so from, from this point of view, we design and build this kind of a mobile house which you can like pack and you know, carry with you uh, as you move from one place to another. Uh, uh, it's inspired by the idea of how, uh, how refugees move from one place to another, uh, which we argue that as probably the future of uh, designing architecture uh, for sustainable uh, mobility. So this was kind of my framework of voice with access, freedom, visibility, and infrastructure. Uh, and I am trying to connect this with United Nations goal of sustainable art development. Uh, in 2015, United Nations uh, has declared their 17 goals for sustainable development, which they want to achieve by 2030. Of them, my work is directly related with uh, five of them, gender equality, innovation, and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, peace and justice, and responsible consumption. But indirectly, it is actually connected with all other sustainable goals that they have. Uh, here are some of my ongoing and future projects. So I have now uh, been heavily working on mental health, where getting the data is really difficult from the patients, um, because there are also superstitions and stigma around them. And the data that you get from the people are not always the data that you can rely on for doing medical purposes, so how can we build the idea of voice there with giving their access, visibility, freedom, and infrastructure uh, from understanding their skills, art, and creativity there. Uh, we are now conducting this project uh, uh, of, uh, in Canada, USA, and Bangladesh, and India. Recently, we got a National Institute of Health grant uh, for, for advancing this project. I'm also working with the refugees who are silenced by the politics of legality. So they are not free to raise their voice because they are uh, called illegal or you know, not native. Uh, I'm working with this privacy aspect and voice, uh, voice building with them. Uh, this project is going on in uh, five places in the world. The Syrian refugees in Toronto, Iraqi refugees in Jordan, Syrian refugees in Turkey, Afghan refugees in Iran, and the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. And recently, I got my Science Art Discovery Grant and Kunat Grant for uh, advancing this project. And finally, I am working with this uh, afterlife of technology uh, or for environmental justice, how we handle the electronic waste around the world, um, how we can give visibility of the work that is historically been invisible. Uh, we, the designers and developers, take all the credit for building a technology and don't give any credit to the people who are maintaining these technologies uh, all around the world. Uh, we are doing this electronic waste uh, uh, 
uh, monitoring in Montreal, Canada, Buffalo, USA, in Czech Republic, and in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And we recently got this uh, CFI grant and Ontario Research Fund for advancing this research. I have got wonderful collaborators in North America, in Bangladesh, and in many other international settings. And thanks to all my collaborators and the funding sources with help on my research. So before ending, I want to uh, bring this quote from the, one of my famous uh, scholars. I, I really admire Ahmed Hussein, who got Nobel Prize in Economics. He said, development is freedom, uh, both through instrumental and constitutive means, which means that uh, to get freedom, you both need technological, technical, infrastructural, uh, instrumental ability, and you also need constitutive means, which means like social or uh, individual ability to use this instrument to get there. So I, through my research, I want to pose this problem, pose this question, can voice provide us with such freedom? So this is kind of like the overarching research question that I have. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you for your powerful presentation. Um, I think we have time for one question at the end of the session, but I believe the chat will be in the room and then we'll see your question in the future. So any question? I already asked one, but if no one else would. Uh, one thing you didn't really talk about too much was the, um, I'm not sure what the right word is, so don't want to say, don't want to use cognitive, don't want to use conceptual, but there, there are worldviews that differ across cultures. And so many of the things that we do on phones are culturally driven and culturally understood. So um, it, how do you bridge that gap and how do you discover that gap when, when you realize that the thing that you're trying to empower someone to be able to do is in some sense not part of the, their, their world view to begin with? Oh, because I, that's different than an interface problem. Yep, yep. It's a, it's a very good question. So it's, it's deeper than understand, deeper than like design. We call it like it's, it's connected with the values that drive the design. So let me, let me give an example. I had a friend who was in the, the Peace Corps, and this was in the 90s, so it's probably a bit dated, but I suspect not completely. And he was there for about two years, and when he was leaving, uh, he was in Malawi, and, and uh, someone he worked with kind of every day who had the desk next to him uh, said, well, gee, I was really glad you were here, and the thing I learned the most from you, my friend, uh, was that when you're trying to accomplish something and you can't make progress on it, you can set it aside and work on something else instead, instead of just stopping and waiting until you can continue. And I don't know, you know how generalizable that is, but that's, a, I think, an example of a very different worldview. Right. And my friend said that he was almost shocked because he hadn't realized there was that gap in their understanding of how things work. And had he known about it, perhaps he would have said something the very first day. But Definitely. So that's why I start my research with ethnography. So ethnography has been um, considered as a tool for understanding culture for a long time for, by anthropologists, social scientists. Um, and, uh, I would say like uh, ethnography is the final answer. Like if you contact ethnography, you understand everything of a culture. But it's probably at least one way to engage with the local community and learn from them. And then uh, the second thing I really value a lot is participatory design, which you just said, like instead of pushing my values to that community and say, this is what you should do, why don't we learn from them and work with them for designing what they think value. Because it, it seems like one of the big steps yeah. is a self-realization exactly. of what those differences are and that right. there are other views. And it's not a question of which views are, are good or bad. Right. It's just that they exist. Definitely, definitely. And this is, this is like often missing in, uh, in, unfortunately, in computer science discourse. Even these days when we talk about ethics a lot in computer science, we often think about our own understanding of ethics, which is situated in this, in this Western uh, world, in this, uh, uh, which we call weird, like Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic environment. And uh, we often 
and when this is called post-colonial computing team, we, uh, we then throw our technology to another places of the world and we expect development will happen because development is happening here, uh, which uh, like miserably fails sometimes. So yes, that's the, that's the way how we learn from our failure, but yes, probably we should, we should do something better for learning without harming people. Yep, good question. Why don't we start here? Uh, but we said we'll be here for further. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you for coming today.